Hi everyone. Um, so yeah, the safety of the the topic of today is is, is safety. So safety is a big uh, a big topic to go through. Um, so that's I'm splitting it up into um, in two session. Uh, the next one will be Friday, and uh, so the first one first session going to be the, the the safety or to improve our safety before going diving because there is a few things to do before to go diving to make all the chance of coming back home in one piece and uh, and not hurt or worse. Um, so the, the first one is uh, our lifestyle, I would say. So what I mean by lifestyle, um, so is our health, um, uh, but uh, uh, in the health there is uh, our um, nutrition. So nutrition is a, it's a good topic because if you got like a a, a bad a bad um, habits food wise is it's like any sport you won't be able to perform properly and even worse in in our case it might uh, bring your um your performance down and so you're not going to enjoy the dive you might suffer the, during the dive um because a bad food uh, hygiene um I'm not going to give you a nutrition um, uh, lecture on that. Uh, just to remember, during the the week before, at least the week, if uh, the rest of the time, if you do what you do, whatever you want, but at least diving, if you can avoid any very heavy meals, uh, very fat meals, um, the rich the rich sugar meals as well, um, this kind of stuff. Um, it will help you to be more comfortable and not having a drop in your performance during the during the dive. Um, that's that's one one thing about the food. Also, having burps of your last kebab uh, during your <laughs> during your dive not going to be the best uh, and the most comfortable dive for you. So, um, despite not really uh, engaging your safety purely. It will gonna start picking up on your mind, so oh, I'm burping, I'm uh, so I'm not comfortable, and then all of that makes that the the dive's not gonna be enjoyable. So before any any dive, try to be light. Uh, if you go for a full day out on either way on the boat, or just from the shore, uh, like a six hours is not uh, uh, rare. People do that from the shore, so. Um, take think about taking having a meal before the night before that's going to give you enough energy to go through your day nicely and not having any problem with your stomach um, so so that's that's for the nutrition so obviously any alcohol uh, if you drink regularly alcohol um or to say that uh, is increasing your dehydration. So we say dehydration, de say uh, maybe cramps, maybe um, dizziness, um, and your effort will last very, uh, will be much shorter. So for a dive you've been waiting for a long time, is it would be shame to. Um, throw it by the window just because having a, a, a reckless week of food and drinks and uh, I have example where people and where I did it and it always end up the wrong way so your dive is going to finish earlier and you're not going to be very happy um, so um, there is no point you we are so happy to go out see why wasting that time because we've been reckless before going. So, um, so yeah, so your hydration before going, your food before going is very important. So that's, that's, that's I will put that into a good nutrition. The other thing as well is having a good sleep. Uh, if you're not sleeping well, you, your safety will be uh, put in, den in danger during your dive. So having a good sleep, uh, I'm not going to do a night out or I'm not uh, going spearfishing if 
it's been like a crazy at work and I've been sleeping two hours for the last two weeks. Going into the sea in that condition of tiredness because the lack of sleep is as dangerous as going and driving uh, 200 kilometers uh, or 200 miles when you didn't do a, 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 night, a good night's sleep as well. You might fall, not, it's not fully asleep behind the wheel for sure, but you're, you're, you're so tired that your body gonna react and the, the switching off or the, you're not gonna feel the first warning of your um, lack of uh, oxygen, uh, the rays of the CO2 first and the lack of oxygen coming. So you might be prone to go into um, the, the, the blackouts. So that's, that's, so the sleep is, is uh, your sleep on top. Uh, in addition to the nutrition, the sleep is something very, very important. And I can give you an example of, uh, I had a week of uh, training camp for hockey and uh, I was very excited to go spearfishing, but when I arrived with my friend, I was exhausted. And after that week, I just, uh, I just sit out. I stay on the boat. I was, I've been the decky for the day. I said to the guy, sorry, I don't feel it. And, and it's, it's, um, it's not, don't be shame of that or whatever is, it's a good move to do saying no today. I can't, uh, it's not being, manly or whatever there is nothing no such a thing in 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 uh, spearfishing you 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 don't put your life at risk just to to prove you are or you what what you are you're just a man and you needed a sleep you didn't get it or you didn't eat properly and whatever okay stay on the boat use the rolling line enjoy your day out on the sea but don't dive i, w I would really say don't dive um I'm gonna go through some questions coming up. Um, okay, Rob, how many hours before diving? I, us I usually wait two, three hours before. I've, uh, when you're having a, a breakfast, you know, example, you have got a meeting at 7 a.m. with your friends at the sleepway or at the, at the, the, in, the in the small bay somewhere, uh, saying, try to have a light a breakfast like two, I would say two hours before going into the water, uh, a light breakfast. So try not any bacon. I know, I know British people like it, but bacon is not a best meal to go in the water, but like a Hoyt, um, the milk, if you can get the Hoyt milk or even doing the porridge with uh, some water instead of milk, it will help your digestion, uh, the, the assimilation. Um, by your stomach stuff like that so go light and take with you some um, some bars uh, you can eat through the day so instead of having a big breakfast like you would normally do to get you through the day because you know you're gonna we're gonna dive and uh, ending up upside down and all of that uh, go uh, with a small almond and you're gonna spread it through the day all right perfect snack um it's tricky because often the bars you will find in the co in the, in shops are either too sugary and too fatty. Um, so I don't have any brand in, in mind, but if you prefer just eating some nuts uh, or some bread, that's that kind of stuff. Because the problem is if you got something too sugary, you're going to take it and it's going to last. Basically, his energy is going to last an, only half an hour because there is some uh, uh, chemicals involved with your insulin it's going to go up and down and your blood sugar are going to go up and down as well so um it's not going to last long uh yeah you need to have like a like a triathlon uh, athletes they got they got uh, stuff for a long period and when they got a big a big dip in your in their during their effort they got a, like a booster so we we need to think a bit similarly when we do spearfishing. So that's, that's the lifestyle. So that's your lifestyle before the dive. So trying to be as healthy. I'm not saying don't go out any, and no, no time. No, uh, what I'm saying is just the couple of days or the week before going climbing, diving or stuff like that. Try to, yeah, try to be a bit soft into the drinks, a bit soft into the heavy food. Um, 
and you will have it will bring you to the dive in the very in very good conditions um so yeah so that's that's for the lifestyle on the other side uh you got some other stuff you can do with your gear so getting all your gear ready uh, taking care of your gear is going to be the main point because once again uh, checking the straps of your mask does my strap is need to changing basically because otherwise it might break when you don't expect it and put you put your safety in danger um, you have as well all your your gear the, so the gear related to the gun so the reel yeah check the reel is not locked because it's been a month three months you didn't use it so you need to do a bit of service of your gear in general so there, there's a few stuff like that so uh, i'm thinking as well so your float make your float ready do you have, i need a flag on it that's part of my safety to be ready before i go diving um on your fins on your fins you can make stuff to improve your safety for before the dive but for for during the dive is uh, having like a white sticker at the back of your fins so your your body will be see, able to see you for longer when you go down and if he goes down when he lost view of you sight of you so it's it's, it's all the why i'm using um I'm using like a, the, the vest with no weight when I dive sometimes when I dive deep uh, with no weight but all the guys who are pro uh, camouflage they will hate me saying that but this orange stuff can can really save your life so getting it ready so well this one is brand new but I got a whistle on it so you can tie up a whistle to your float you are thinking taking with you uh you you will have your knife on it and there is no weight so it's not a problem you can keep it 20 well you, you will be a bit less uh, uh hydrodynamic but it will work you can check your torch do i need to change my torch do i need to to change the the, the bulb to change the batteries uh a bit of uh, grease on uh, on the o-ring or whatever i'm not using the torch i know, I know many people using the torch as a as a, a tool to get the fish i'm not using it um i grew up not using it so and i carry on it's very rare when i use a torch but i always have a torch on my float or on the boat because that's uh, that's going to be my flashing stuff to attract attention so yeah so making making everything ready before your dive so we saw the lifestyles lifestyles is the what I'm doing on my everyday basis to make it to make me ready to arrive on the day of the dive in the best conditions uh, of sleep of well sleep rest uh, food wise as well um, because all of that can play on your safety uh, so and after the other side is obviously the gears um, yeah for, I, I was I forgot as well but um, uh, you can uh, also check your knife. Does my blade is too rusty? Is it gonna maybe it's gonna break or is it sharp enough? Because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, the knife you're gonna find in uh, in shops uh, at first they're not sharp enough at all. So if you need them, you won't cut anything. So you need to sharpen them properly. Sharpening them so it's gonna take five ten minutes maybe or half an hour, but it's worth it. It's gonna it's gonna change your safety. Well, you can change your safety and save your life during the dive. So all these points you need to go through before the dive. And the the best example is gonna be when that confinement gonna go out. We're gonna be all excited to go out, all wanted to go. Yeah, yeah. But did we all check our gear? Our gear are are ready. We're probably gonna be rested because most of us are not doing much um and physically we are home but we are a bit stressed yeah but we we're a bit stressed by the by the situation by the, what's what's going to happen next for us so really um take it easy don't don't try to go and beat uh, beat your best dab you know by whatever matters no take uh, choose the sports 
an easy dive, and uh, and and the, the day will be um, the day will be there. You know, you you you're not gonna miss out much if um, you choose an easy day, and then the next ones they will come. Uh, it's not it's not rushing into something. Rushing is never good. I got. A few examples of a uh, day where you rush things and uh, you end up at the slipway or even on 10 miles out on the spot and uh, oh I don't know if my mask or or you 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 do the first few kick of your during your dive and the blade is unglue itself from the foot pocket so well lucky me it unglue itself on the surface but if the same happened at 20 meters or 15 meters or 30, whatever the depth, it could have changed everything. But what? Why? Because I rushed my my hours or my day before. Uh, I didn't take the time to go through my gear and make sure I got all the gear set and ready to be used. Uh, I can I can let you uh, uh, quickly introduce yourself because some people there on the chat don't know you. And um, if you want to uh, to talk about the hydration, uh, apparently you got some good stories. So okay, lovely. Well, hi guys. Uh, my name is Anvar. Uh, I live in Cyprus, so geographically far from the UK. But uh, warm waters, deep diving, good visibility. Whenever you can come to Cyprus, you're more than welcome. I can show you around. Uh, yes, to speak about my diving, we usually go quite deep, so it's. 35 meters plus this is matter by the way in my diving recently so let's say over the last year i think uh, what i found was lacking in my own diving was hydration because i always thought you know you drink whatever whenever it's not a problem but uh, the biggest invention to myself was uh, this realization that hydration is super important and we never think about it well very Often spiros don't care about it, but uh, how do you guys like feel uh, after the dives usually? Did, did anybody actually pay attention to how you feel? For example, I used to have headache, my knees would hurt, I would feel like a zombie. I thought it's like a. I thought this was normal, and only when I started paying attention to hydration, I actually found the reason for all those problems. And luckily, my wife, uh, she was just here, she's a dietitian, so once we've run a project and we found, uh, we had some pretty cool findings. Okay, it will not apply to the UK, uh, but in Cyprus, during the summer, during our diving from shore, we would lose on average around 800 milliliters per hour. I think that's massive. And when you put it in the context, it's, I think, tremendous. And uh no like all of a sudden you understand why your head would hurt why your knees would hurt why you start feeling like crap basically uh so the thing that i would suggest to all of us uh, to do is to pay attention to how much we drink and what we drink because like we can speak about it for hours but drinking just water sometimes could hurt you uh, like it's a very deep topic, but when uh, Max, uh, I think you might want to chime in. How do you lose liquids when you're spearfishing? So basic, basically, we we it's like in uh, on land. We're using it because we're peeing. We're using it because we're sweating. In two main ways: the sweating and the urine. These two main ways to lose water. So. The only way to compensate their loss is to drink. If to put it in. To put back in, yeah. To put, to, to put and, it back uh, in. The problem, which, uh, the problem that I had, for example, is I would think, okay, it's only water. But the problem is once you sweat or once you pee, usually you get rid of electrolytes. Yes, and so electrolytes are super crucial for the signals going, traveling around the body. And... Uh, Simply drinking water, it breaks down. It, it yeah, the, yeah. If you drink only water, uh, you will uh, yeah. deplete yourself even more. So it's not always the best way. That's why I, I was talking a bit earlier, uh, thinking as a, a triathlete. 
they they taking things and not it's not only water during their effort they taking uh, electrolytes and special nutrition during the effort and also apart for avo avoiding being dehydrated during the dive is getting a good hydration before the dive and also make sure you focus on it during the dive too because uh, what we found in our little research unfortunately the body cannot retain liquids so for example you get in the water you drink three liters ahead of the dive let's say three liters during the first hour you're just gonna pee more sweat more but you're gonna go back to this minimal level and unfortunately if you don't top up the levels during the dive your uh, this extra water that you drank before the dive the effects will end very soon so it's important to constantly put in liquids what you could do and i think it's very cool uh, it's very simple you just have a, some water with salt or some powerade gatorade some uh, drink on your buoy if you use the float or a buoy uh, so for example i'm not sure how much fish you guys shoot but you shoot one fish you put it on a buoy you have a sip you go back to diving shoot some fish get back to the buoy have a sip and this is uh the way we do it here now and i feel a tremendous uh increase in performance on the days i drink as against to the days that i don't drink anything yeah, yeah. well i was uh, i was just giving the example of uh, going into a dive after a night out and drinking some alcohols and everything you arrive with already a lack of hydration uh, so you're gonna make your and then the problem is you're gonna make your safety at risk again during uh, during that uh, that dive yes uh, there is if we speak about breath holding well it's it's about track and field but there was a study where uh, some scientists researchers they tested the track and field athletes and there was I think a 15% difference in performance of well hydrated athlete versus mildly dehydrated athlete. Yeah. So once you're in the water, it's not only that your dives are longer, but you feel more comfortable, you're feeling much more relaxed, you enjoy everything more, you can hold your breath longer. So it's like an overall more pleasing experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, Chris is saying they might, uh, oh, Chris, is that Chris? No, it's uh, Jack is just saying he might die of uh, dehydration. Uh, one fish, one sip, because he's not catching many fish. No, that's that's why. <laughs> but don't worry. Just just when you reload, because I know you're shooting a lot. So when you reload one sip, you'll be you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Uh, Rob is talking about some uh, supplements on uh, Amazon. So honestly, I don't know what is on Amazon. Um, I would date some specialized uh, shops of triathlon, and I would go and have a chat with them and see what they advise for for three athletes and i think it would be a a good compromise uh for us because also what you're gonna have is the pop some some of the the stuff you can find in shops or online uh they they give acidic very acidic they're very acidic and they can give you uh, like a, a reflux so it's not going to be the best so you need to you need to find the one you like and uh, and the one who suits you as well and answer to the needs of your dive. If you if you're gonna dive an hour, well, okay, you need to be hydrated, that's for sure. But uh, at the opposite, you don't have to a uh, long-lasting stuff. It's gonna be just a short sip or even just water, you'll be fine. Um, but if you go for a long dive, long swims, yes, yeah, think about like a, a triathlete. Okay, it's going to be a long, long effort and with a lot of loss. So you're going to have to compensate that. I think it's uh, great uh, to start focusing on drinking water or anything first and uh, then develop your uh, habit and then start uh, thinking about uh, what you're drinking and how. And uh, The thing is, uh, if, if you drink only water, uh, it happened to all of us say uh, you get bored so you need to find some tricks to trick yourself to make you drink a bit more to get your hydration going doesn't matter you need to change the taste change the color 
uh, bubbles, not bubbles, whatever. But you need to get this stuff going. But also not drinking, I would say, bad and hyper, hyper, um, how you call it, hypertonic drinks or uh, very rich sugary drinks and stuff like that. I don't know what you think, Anvar, but I think we are around that. Eh? It's, it's about building the habit, yes. Uh, ideally, you look, I prefer the simple, the poor man's thing. I usually have water, and when I feel like I need some electrolyte salts, I just take a gulp of the sea. I know it's, it doesn't sound right, and it's maybe not the most hygienic thing to do, but I just cannot make myself get up earlier in the morning, get some drinks ready, I don't know, mix some formula, like it's, salty water is fine for me. It's not everyone's choice, for sure. Yeah, I'm not sure it's a, it's a good recommendation, that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that just makes sense to uh, try to uh, a good rest, good hydration before your dive. Get all your gear, your gear checked. Uh, that's very important as well. And um, and um, it's it was a lot to cover. Uh, we had some technical issue on that one. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, but uh, hopefully Friday we will uh, have a bit more time uh, to um, to chat a bit longer about how to manage your safety and stay safe during your dive and what's the small habits to get also during your dive to, to be sure you come back home. We're just going to start the day. Yeah, that's the, the morning. You, you, you pack your, all your stuff in the car. Everything is ready. And um, so you've been checking all your gear, you've been checking for the last couple of days, probably, or even a week, if you're a bit, uh, a bit like, um, how, how do you say that in English? I don't know, um, it's not, yeah, it's, it's, you got the word, but, uh, um, so you, you're gonna check all of your stuff the, during the last couple of days, and uh, you end up, okay, you've got all your gears, everything is set, so now it's time to go. So, first thing, and it's going to be the same recommendation that's uh, the RNLI is giving. All right. Uh, so the the RNLI is uh, is advising to uh, say to someone who's going to stay on land, uh, where are you go where are you going, the your ETA of coming back, uh, and how many people we are with you. So it, it's it's just the first thing to do. But it could be your girlfriend, just a friend to know where you are, and we're going to be. Alerted if you if you don't when you come back, if you don't uh, if you don't say anything, if you had no news, okay, you can raise the alarm, ring the bell, and maybe deploy the help. Um, that's why at the other end of the, your dive, you don't forget to alert them, uh, saying okay, I'm out and and safe. Um, so that's one thing. Um, do you want to do? Do you want to say something, Anvar? What, or do you uh, start your day before that diving? Do you, do you want to say something or, or you, you, you see your day? Well, uh, I would like to actually say something about the Coast Guard thing, because uh, we had these issues before, and I think it's very important, like you mentioned, you have to speak with somebody close to you so that you'd say, okay, look, by eight o'clock, I'm gonna give you a call or whatever. And uh, we had some issues before when, my partner's wife like we wouldn't answer the phone or something so she started calling people she called his mother and she was like okay look i think the guy is dead i think they both died we should call the call coast guard they called the police the police so the whole thing just went crazy and uh, like everything could have been settled if only we said okay look at eight we give you a call whatever the worst case scenario, for example, eight o'clock, we give you a call. And this is what I do with my wife. I say, look, uh, usually when the, it's one hour, one hour after the sun sets. So the sun sets, even if my boat flipped and I have no fins and I'm stuck with a tuna somewhere far out, I'll be by the shore, uh, like by the time. If not, Okay, then you can start all go funny, like you could start calling the Coast Guard, but like there is no point to call the Coast Guard earlier because if, well, something actually bad happens, then 
like it happened you know <laughs> yeah 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 I, I i agree with that there there is no 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 need so if they got your your people close to you got the right information to know when they got when you got to come back um they they won't worry or you say i call straight away when i'm out of the water or for mostly for around uk uh we will have reception you can be maybe maybe back on the boat but not back to shore but so just send a text and at least on the way back he will the the message will be sent and people say you're safe on the boat on your way back and that's finished and we there's uh, no no need to um no need to uh, or to say that to um to make everyone worry and starting uh engaging all the safety crews and all of that so it's it, it costs money it put pressure on everyone um yeah so please uh do do so do inform your your close people well, the people close to you uh where you're going and your timing so that's one of the first thing um after well if you got a boat or not doesn't matter you will have to recheck your weather you will have to check the sea state uh, because locally it can be very flat, but maybe uh, where, where you're going to drive to do your uh, jump in, the weather is going to quite a swell or the, yeah, it's going to be a bit different than the, the, the local condition where you check the, um, the weather forecast. Uh, so it can be better, but it can also be worse. So you, when you arrive on sites, you're going to need to, assess that and decide, okay, should I go, should I not go? Um, that's one thing. Um, once, and the weather forecast, you need to keep that in mind, is, is not something static. It's gonna be something we're gonna evolve all through the day and you need to keep an eye on it because if you don't keep an eye on it, you're gonna be, you could get uh, caught into a storm and don't even realize it until it's too late or until you, you're gonna struggle to come back to shore. So keep an eye uh, with the tide because, the, yeah, here in the UK, we got big tides in some areas. So the tide, the weather uh, can be, can be um, putting at risk your safety. So you need to have that in your mind and think, okay, every half an hour or two hours, okay, I just, you know, pop my head and look around. Okay, the sea is not white. You know, there is not white horses on the sea. That's fine. It's still, uh, the weather is quite stable today, so okay, I carry on. Well, now, uh, now, oh, I, can, I can see sea horse. Uh, what you call that? Uh, white horses on the on the sea, and um, and you end up with uh, okay, maybe the swell is picking up. Maybe the spots uh, where I'm going to have to get out uh, is going to be very tricky to get out. And for that, I can ask uh, maybe Corey to talk about one spot where to came uh, like three or four years ago when I arrived. And, uh, and if you don't know on that place, special place, if you die, shore dive it, you won't be able to get out if you don't get it right and if the swell is too big. So I, I'm just gonna un unmute uh, Corey and he can talk about it quickly. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So yeah, I remember we went to... Uh, um, which one? We went to a couple of, uh, you took me to two spots, both so the, of about a mile out. So the, um, the, we the, swam. the one I'm thinking is the one um, with the island, the big island in near, near Tintagel. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> I remember that well, yeah. So, very safe diving with Max. So we went out, um, when we arrived at the spot early in the morning, Max even had a like a little mini chalkboard. He drew out the island. He showed me exactly where the tide was coming from. He said, we need to swim out of this angle um, so the tide can take us a little bit. And then once we're at the rock, we can tuck in behind. And, uh, you know, then we wait for the tide to go down and then we follow the tide back in. So it was well thought out. He explained it all before we went out. And then, uh, yeah. We got down to the beach. Max said to me, um, duck dive under the waves with a bodyboard. And this is why we use the bodyboards. Um, so you can kick out 
nice and quick, duck under the waves, let the breakers go over your head. And then once you're out past the breakers, yeah, it's clockwork. You know, you just swim out nice and easy. And um, yeah, it was great spear fishing, really good. The bass everywhere. Um, I got a little bit seasick, as I do. And uh, yeah, it was great. Loads of bass around. Um, and then um, when the tide started to drop, it eased off. And then we worked our way back in with loads of fish. So you have to think it out through, uh, think it out really well. There's another time as well, which I'll mention. Uh, I, do you remember when we went out with Joel? Yeah. And um, yeah, again, I trust Max with my life. You know, you have to. We went out, and this was a bit further than the one in Tintagel. So we swam out, and yeah, the, it was a, a, a nice tidal area. Max said, in 20 minutes, this is the tide's going to drop. And we're going to have great spear fishing. When we went out there, there was a big bull seal that was following Joel around. I think it scared him a little bit. Um, but they're pretty playful. I don't know if you get it over there, Ambar, but yeah, the seals are quite cool. Um, so yeah, the Coast Guard pulled up next to us and um, Joel got a lift back in because of the tide. Uh, it was, you know, we're fighting the tide for a bit when we're out there. And then all of a sudden, bang, the tide just stopped completely. And then the hunting was perfect. We shot plenty of fish. Um, yeah, the Coast Guard took, took the lad back in, Joel. Um, but yeah, it was all controlled. It was all well thought out. And then on the way back in, me and Max just had a nice, gentle swim back in. And uh, yeah, it was great. You have to do your research. That's the main thing. Thank and you. the day before, Max sends us, sends us like exactly what the tide's doing hourly. And then the day, before, the morning we go out, he's checking it again on the boat. You know, you need to pay attention to signs and stuff. The tide isn't always predictable when you're out there you could think oh, okay the tide's going to drop off at this time it can change a little bit so judge it when you're out there is the key so yeah yeah so just 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 uh, I, I wanted to Corey to say that all the story is all the the planification behind the dive is okay we did uh, we we decided to go somewhere but we didn't go and jump like uh, crazy into somewhere we we didn't know and even if it's a place you don't know, you need to assess it. You just don't go blind, completely blind. You can go blind because the blind side is going to be, uh, okay, I don't know what kind of fish, what kind of uh, reef I'm going to find, what kind of ground I can find even. But uh, you need to do your homework and, uh, and really do your, um, your research for the current and the tides and how the area is behaving with the tide. So... Um, Anwar, you want to add up something to that part? Uh, also, you guys say that the currents of tides are bad. Well, obviously, it's very uncomfortable to swim uh, with the tides, but here in Cyprus, at least, well, in the Met, uh, unfortunately, the most fish you see is when the tide is super strong. So when you have the strongest current, it's when you're going to see the most fish, which is uncomfortable but then it's like a motivation to go out and actually suffer a little bit yeah the, the only issue is uh, here in the uk uh, the tide can go up to seven knots so you don't you don't go in as i, I understand what you mean when you got 1.5 two knots you it's still yeah, maximum two knots we yeah, don't have more than two. yeah no more than that but here in the UK, we've got area up to six, seven knots. So it's not diveable. It's not safe to dive at yeah, all. Yeah, of so that's, that's why you need to learn a bit more about uh, that part. Um, so, yeah. So once, once you plan your dive, you know where you're going. You, you did your research. Um, okay, let's go by the sea. Uh, you informed uh, your next of kin uh, where you're going. Okay, good. And then now you're on the seaside. And then uh, you decide, okay, it's safe to go. 
um, what's, what you're going to have to do is, okay, do I have my bottle? Because last time we talked about the hydration. So, okay, my dive is going to be about five hours, four hours. I, I'm counting about half a liter an hour. So that means you need a bottle of two, uh, two liters with you. You need two liters of water with you to just kind of counter this uh, di dehydration and a few bars or gel, uh, energe energetic gel uh, to, to keep up for this uh, four hours dive. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's something. Uh, the other thing is after, okay, the dive gonna start. See, the, you are in the sea. Um, I would say um, we need to buddy up. And buddying up is not say, I'm not saying that, uh, okay, one here and, and the other 100 meters away. But the app is uh, being together uh, pretty much at all time. And if you enga engage dives where you know you're going to reach or be close to your limit, okay, grab your buddy and say, oh, this, might, this dive might be a bit deeper than uh, I do normally. Okay, so that means the, your buddy must do nothing else than watching you, nothing else at all. So you, you, your body needs to focus on you only and not trying to find another fish, another cable, whatever. Um, so I know, I know that in most of the cases, often you won't have your body with you. I know it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say you must have a body to go out. I know you're going to go out anyway. So I'm not there to tell you not, don't go out if you don't have a body, but just be sensible then into your, your choice okay maybe i'm not gonna do an open sea uh, dive today but more uh, a quiet in the bay just looking for lobster or scallops in the shallow um instead of uh, trying to find a, a deep wreck uh, far out or stuff like that so it's it's really and you need to be also honest with your um um fitness level uh if it's been month, you didn't do anything. Month, you didn't move. Uh, you've been eating or partying or whatever reason you didn't train properly. Don't don't expect your body to uh, to have the good reaction. On okay, now today I can go back to where I was last summer after a whole summer of uh, spearfishing every single day. No, I'm not ready for that. So be sensible and keep keep yourself safe and your body safe into saying okay. We, we do an easy dive today. Uh, so, Anwar, you want to add something? Yeah, communication is the key. And I see it very often when we, well, I don't now dive with a lot of people because I don't want to take responsibility for some crazy people. But uh, I see it very often when guys get in the water and then they just separate. So there is absolutely no meaning in being uh, a group but staying separate. So what I would suggest or what I do with my partner is before the dive, we usually say, okay, we stick together, we do this, 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 but then we go there, then we do, like we both know what the plan is. And then we just stick to the plan. Yeah. It's very seldom that we actually need the help of the partner. However, statistically, there will be the day when you would rather have the partner next to you and like it would be very cool if he is there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, I don't wish anyone to, have, to need his buddy, but the day you need it, uh, you'll be happy to have him grabbing him on the side or just being there to support you or whatever. So really um, try to use it as much as possible. Um, after, to improve your safety, you can work out some tr basic training, safety training. So as a, as a diver, as myself, you can work on your on your how to drop my weight training to drop your uh, your um, your belt because what's the problem is often you go maybe you you go a bit deeper than normal so you're a bit overweighted and then what's going to happen you go go down oh i feel i feel go i feel good i can go down no you're not pushing very hard on your fin so you're very relaxed you land and then now it's time to come back and when you come back up, suddenly, oh, it's hard because you have to push all that weight back up. And, and 
and say, oh, I didn't expect to be that hard. And, and then is when you're starting to be dangerous because you're going to push so hard and you didn't expect to, to push so hard on the way back, then you use more oxygen than you pl than plan and you're not ready. You're not going to have enough to go all the way back up. But releasing your belt will, save you, will, will probably save you because once you release your belt and it's on the, on the seabed, you're going to pop to the surface in less than 10, 15 seconds from 20 meters. So it's, it's really, um, it's, or to say that it's, it's really uh, important to learn uh, how to release your belt and to, and to practice it a little bit because you, you set up your belt, uh, up, you're setting up, setting up your belt uh, one way, up, So here, okay. So, but if if during your dive you're gonna you're gonna look, uh, oh, where where is my where is my my belt? And uh, oh, I got my belt uh, and that, and you don't know where is the buckle. You need to know, okay, the buckle. I know that the buckle is still in front of me. Oops, all right. Um, also, you can you need to set up the buckle the right way around as well because. As you can see, when I'm gonna pull here, the pin gonna open and stay open. That's that's the normal position of your uh, pin on the buckle when it's in the rest. Um, so I'm gonna reshow. So your that's your buckle is locked, and now as soon as I just pull, I don't need a big effort. And this one, when the, when the buckle, when the belt is open, stay up. So that means that side of the belt, not gonna be stuck anywhere and everything gonna be re released very quickly. After you don't want to have too much of that section after the buckle, because otherwise you're gonna have to tangle it around the, the, around the belt. So a few 15, 20 centimeter maximum, just up to here, here. I just put it a bit high so you can see. All right, so this one is slightly too big, but too long, but it's gonna be there. And I got this loop there. So if I want to grab it, I got it and it's finished and I drop my weight. So thinking to how to set up your uh, belt is also one of very important points of your safety. And um, I just, I can give you an example. Uh, well, that was last summer, but it, it happened to me uh, a lot. Um, I did some, um, some deep dives, no problem, but uh, it was deep dive, my body was on the surface. But I came back to the surface with my belt in hand. So if ever I'm going to black out or whatever, and I pop to the surface. And uh, yeah, maybe I, I, I'd struggle a little bit to take it off and hold it. It's a bit harder. But once I release it, because I'm blacking out, I will pop to the surface. And that might save my life. So, and your buddy will be seeing you popping on the surface. Because most of the accidents, Blackout accident is in the last 10 meters. Uh, over 10 meters is not a blackout accident. Often it's gonna be more like a, a vascular accident, a, heart, a proper heart attack, or other, other reason. It would be more medical than the dive itself. Hanvar, you diving a bit deeper than us, but. Uh... Uh, I wanted to add to your belt suggestion. Uh... There could be an issue. I'm not sure where you guys put your uh, knife holsters. Like, how do you tie your uh, knives? But I've seen often when people, okay, some people have it on their hand. I use it on a belt. Some people put it on the calf. And the problem could be if people release the belt and they just drop it, sometimes the belt would stuck. It would tangle on your feet or it would tangle on the hands. And I've seen it happen. So, for example, uh, in Ida, I'm a freediving instructor. What we tell our students is 
You hold the belt, you release the buckle, but you don't just drop it down. You, you drop it to the side. So you make sure that it doesn't touch your fins or your knife or whatever. Yeah, yeah you make sure. I haven't seen yeah. many, I haven't seen many Europeans uh, attaching the knives to their calves, but Russians, like they all love putting it on the calf. Like I have no idea why. I mean, it's just. Uh, yeah. for, for the knife, I, I used to have it in the inside of my, uh, of my calf. So, but uh, since a while now, I'm 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 using it on the on the biceps, and uh, and it's uh, I really like it. Or even is on the on the vest I'm using, it's strapped on the vest. So even if I drop my belt, I still have my knife with me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Make makes sense. We don't use vests, so I'm not very familiar with them. All right. One thing hey, also about the partner, because you started speaking about it earlier, and I think it's a very big issue. Um, of course, having a partner, it's great for your safety and for mental support and all the support, blah, 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 all the chats and singing and making jokes. Yes. However, I think it's a very wrong approach when people start to push the responsibility onto the partner. For example, we go diving with you, Max, and uh, if I was not me and you were not you, but I would think, okay, you know, Max is next to me. Fuck it. Like, I'm just going to push. My partner is there. Like, it's okay. He's going to save me. However, if I do push and if for some reason you just look the other way on my surfacing, I would expect you to save me or I would expect you to interfere. You're not there. Boom. Gone. And I see it a lot with the amateurs or beginners. They will say, okay, well, my partner is there, so I can push it. I can, like, I don't care how deep it is. 30 meters. 35, whatever, I'm just going to go there, I'm going to do it. But then I think it's very wrong to put the resp responsibility on somebody else. And yeah. uh, I, I think the best way to do is, okay, you dive only as deep or as long as you personally can live with. If you can't come up from 45 or 35 or whatever, don't go there. Don't expect your partner to be there. Yeah, so, yeah I see, I see. I I see what I see what you mean. I, I agree with you as well. Eh? When I say I'm going to push it is maybe I'm going to be just slightly out of what I normally do. Uh, you know, you, you do, normally, OK, you 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 uh, hunting around 15, 15 meters. OK, and then maybe you got to go down to 18. So you don't know you, you're exploring. You, you know, we we all explore a bit our our feelings with the depth, we, uh, we exploring the, the, all this, uh, yeah, sensation of, uh, the squeeze and all of that. So you don't know what, how you're going to react to it. So, uh, and if you know, you, you might reach that little point. I'm not saying you're going to go from 15 in the same time and, uh, trying a 25 or 30 meters because your body is there. Exactly. Uh, I agree hundred percent with what you say. Uh, but you know, you can do 30, but you know, that's, uh, that wreck is maybe maybe 32. Uh, if you're gonna shoot a big ah, field, no, this is perfectly fine, of course. Yeah, yeah. You look, guys. Uh, like I, I strongly believe that we always have to push to get better. I'm not talking about some kamikaze style hardcore diving, but we always have to push our limits step by step. But uh, you can push it in a clever way. If you're gonna go super deep, okay, sure. Tell your body, look, I'm gonna push now. Just make sure you pay more attention than usually. No problem, go whatever depth you want. But we shouldn't, on every dive, we shouldn't expect somebody to come and save us. So for example, when we dive with my partner, regardless of how shitty the dive went, even if I'm feeling crappy, like I would, uh, I would rather not, I would rather him not interfere with the dive. Even if he comes and says, give me the gun, usually I would say, no, no, like, because I put myself into this hole, I'm going to get myself out. If something happens, sure. But, I mean, that's my approach. Yeah, well, I think safety-wise is, is quite sensible, uh, Andra. Um, it's like, it's what, uh, it's what, what, what I'm advising when, uh, unfortunately, you're not diving at all with, your, with a buddy. 
uh, not everyone has a, the chance to, and the luck to have a buddy who can be there every single time you want to go out. Uh, it's to, okay, well, normally I'm, I'm diving 50 or 18. Okay, maybe today I'm not going to go over the 15 meter mark. I'm doing two minute breathful normally. Okay, I go down to 130. And then like that, you kind of uh, avoiding to entering uh, your, uh, to, you know, getting out of your comfort zone with, on your own. So, but I, I see the point with you not having, by expecting at uh, all time, having your body being there to uh, help you if something goes wrong. No, um, yeah, I, I agree with that. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I was just going to say earlier, Max, when you're showing your belt, another little thing that stops your belt from sliding round is that that thing you showed me, the, um, the, uh, that's the, the string that goes underneath, um, underneath your crutch, it stops your belt from rising up, um, but it stops it from spinning round as well, because you don't want your belt too tight so it doesn't move. But yeah, Max has got this, uh, this bit that goes underneath there. So that's a great help. And I still use that even, even with lighter weights. Like I'm in Dubai using like three, four kg, but I still like to use this. So I can have the belt a little bit looser. So um, stopping it from sliding around. Um, and, and after, I think also... Um a basic if you if you have a buddy and everything and uh, i think a, a basic uh, free dive course because i know spearfishing courses um don't really provide any uh um or to say that uh, rescue ish uh, uh training um but uh, go for a, a basic uh, free dive course and i i, I think anva can agree they, they will teach you how to bring up and treat your guy on the surface if ever you need to do uh, because it's not in the panic you're gonna try to uh, create things or maybe you might doing it wrong so i would say go and do a um, spearfishing uh, a free dive training um i i know i'm doing some of the basic safety uh, and recovery um during my uh, my trainings uh during my courses but so uh, we we don't have any accreditation yet. Uh, we're working with the with the BSA, which is our uh, English Federation, to uh, to create a baseline uh, guidelines and stuff like that regarding training of spearfishing instructors. So uh, with Tony as well from uh, uh, Spearfishing uh, UK. Sorry. Um, so there is nothing in the UK yet, but uh, it will. And uh, but for the moment. I would uh, I would advise to go and do a training uh, with the free dives um, clubs or um, uh, small um, companies uh, because they they have the experience. We I don't know why in the UK is so late because in France um, we can, we are same level spear fishing and uh, free dive are pretty much the same, at the same level for the safety for the training of the instructors and everything, but in the UK. There is all these instructors from ADAS, uh, the FFI, and all of that. Um, they're here, but the, the BSA didn't do anything for a long time. But now they want to move on, so we're going to work out to uh, set up something properly to uh, to train people and uh, how to react if something happened. Um, yeah, uh, Anwar, I think you can uh, you can confirm the. Um, the training you can get from a freediving uh, uh, course or training? Hi, yes. I, well, it's a plenty of federations now, and I'm not sure about the UK scene, but around the Met, tons of instructors, tons of schools. Just make sure you do your research about the particular school or instructor. And uh, you said that a lot of spearos, like spearfishing courses, they don't focus on safety. Uh, what you could always do, and this is what I did back in the day, mm -hmm. is... Uh, when I finally understood that I needed to get a course, I looked for an instructor who was a Spiro, and the guy was amazingly good. So all my instructors, they were like narrowed to this guy, because I knew he could fish like 40, 45 meters. 
I've seen this stuff, I've spoken with him before. There is one uh, kind of little thing. Very often free divers, like a strictly free diving course, uh, some skills or techniques that you learn, they're not out of the box applicable to spearfishing. So sometimes you'll have to think a bit, you'll have to twist and turn. But still, I think if you guys spend some time, like it's pretty simple. But I would strongly suggest uh, investing into education. Because yeah. it's not the guns and fins and suits, it's very often well, what stays in here. Yeah, um, I, I also like, uh, um, I heard that from another Spiro. I would dive also quite deep in everything, but, and, uh, but he has a club, a spearfishing club uh, in the south of France in Marseille. And he say, oh, if you want to go skiing, you're going to go and get a, a course of skiing. You're not going to go jump on a ski on your own and try to, do so, to slide the slopes. No, you're going to get a course. You're going to learn how to do it. So basically, it's going to be it's the same thinking with spearfishing. Um, they, there is some, some guys saying, uh, some other examples where they say, I learn in my course, uh, not my, my personal one, eh? in, in the course I, t I took, I learn more than I would learn in a, in a year time of spearfishing on my own and not, not just doing, trying to do something. So being in contact with somebody who can teach you some tricks and techniques and, and also your safety because that the main subject of that, um, but make sure you doing it the right way. Okay. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's very important. So a course could be an option, um, to to um to learn for your safety uh and how to manage yourself uh in the water guys i wanted to know maybe somebody experienced anything about like a blackout or some buzz it would be interesting if somebody did leave a message in the chat and maybe we can go over it because i think it's one thing that's super scary well it's mm, it's not the most pleasant thing to happen but if any of you ever experienced, like, I don't know, dizziness during the dive, or you actually considered dropping the belt, or you did drop the belt, or, uh, like, anything like this happening, because, like, it could be useful. Max, do you personally think that blackouts are super bad? The, the, the problem with the blackout is um, the blackout itself is not super bad. It's just, uh, it's just passing out. The problem is we are in a very dangerous environment, which is the water. And we're not meant to breathe any water. So the, 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 the problem is more there than the, the blackout. The blackout itself is not, you do that on land. If you are in your bed or in your house, well, okay, maybe you're going to bang your, your head against a corner and die, but most likely you're going to just fall and crush down and be there and uh, laying for mm -hmm. one or two minutes, but it won't be dangerous more than that. Uh, the, the problem with us having blackouts is you are in a dangerous environment. We are not meant to be there. So uh, that's why we need to prevent it and <clears throat> avoid anything possible to, to not happening. Because the problem is, is uh, there is a lot of, uh, um, there is a lot of uh, black, the, or to say that there is a lot of uh, people doing blackout and everything and being rescued. So everything is fine. And, but I wouldn't know, well, personally, I wouldn't die for the next month, probably, uh, because, you know, I, I just, okay, you, you went very close to something wrong, very wrong, and uh, I wouldn't dive again after that for just a, a good month, probably. But uh, the problem is when uh, something happened and uh, your body is not that close or... The, the, I, I personally been hit by two deaths of my... Um, Two, two friends. I wasn't there, I wasn't with them, but I lost one in 2009 and one last summer. So 10 years in between two, the two. And like uh, the one I lost last year, I can tell you, uh, bottom, bottom uh, de uh, the max depth was 28 meters. The top depth, uh, the, um, the time was one minute 50 in total. But when the police plug in the, his dive watch uh, at 128, so not even, not even one minute 30 under the water, 
he was already at 10 meters. And at 10 meters, he blacked out probably at 10 or 10 or 8 meters, between 10 and 8 meters. And it took him an, another 20 seconds to slowly float all the way to the surface. And he's been fine on us, floating on the surface by mm. some of the friends. Unfortunately, they didn't manage to bring him back. Uh, so black, being on the surface and keeping your airway out of the water, I would say it doesn't matter the style. Uh, it will be um, a good skill to learn. Yeah, recovery breathing. It's the breathing that you do once you reach the surface. Super important. Uh, one other thing that you guys could focus on, actually, it's about, it's not very connected. It's not much connected to blackouts, but it could attribute to it or failing to do, could attribute to a blackout. Uh, a lot of videos online, well, when I watch some videos now, because everybody's watching videos now, uh, a lot of guys exhale on the way up and you can see the bubbles, which is um, not the best idea. And uh, <clears throat> another, uh, another way for you guys to conserve, not to conserve, but to get some of the oxygen back is, again, a lot of people do it. Uh, Actually, pay attention when you watch the spearfishing videos, when guys have their cameras on the head or on the gun, pay attention to the bubbles. They don't directly exhale. However, they're not using the air they have in the mask. It's not, very, it's not much applicable to the UK because you don't really equalize the mask too much. But once you go to 30, 40, you have to equalize your mask. And given that the mask is small, you could give, well, maths-wise, you could uh, lose, like, 15% of your total line capacity just to equalize the mask. Once you start coming up, the mask air gets bigger, the volume increases, and usually people, they just like, they, they just let the bubbles go. So on the way up, you're losing 15% of your total line capacity. It could be the air that would have potentially saved you later on down the line. So, Anwar, you, you mentioned about uh, people that experienced any kind of situation. Now, I'm sure there will be a lot of people that um, may be ashamed or they, they, they're not comfortable in sharing. <clears throat> However, last year, I had um, a, a very mild experience where, uh, where, I, where I seriously thought about dropping my belt. Um, I've uh, started the procedure. Uh, luckily, I, uh, I didn't have to. However, um, the story goes pretty simple. I'm with my dive buddy. Uh, we are uh, obviously very far away from each other. And uh, I'm having a, a very good dive, very, very nice experience. I'm feeling very comfortable. Uh, I'm doing some, uh, some, some longer times than I'm used to, but I'm feeling great. So, uh, so I decided that uh, you know, I, I can just about keep doing what I'm doing, uh, good recovery time, everything works fine. So uh, I dive along a, a broken reef. Um, there's not much going on. I keep uh, swimming with the tide. Uh, my body's feeling great. My, my lungs are great. My mind is focused on looking for fish. And uh, as I start deciding that it's time to go up, I, uh, I see two crabs, which are uh, literally one on top of another. So I decide to grab them both. I grab them both and I'm spending a lot of energy thinking about how not to, to get the crabs to actually pinch my hand. I'm starting to, 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 to surface and, and as soon as I'm starting to push my legs really, really hard, I'm having uh, this uh, strange tingling feeling uh, starting with my face and slowly lowering on my body. Uh, I uh, drop one of the crabs, grab my uh, belt, uh, and uh, pull, pull to, to disengage it. I feel the belt disengaging, and uh, in my head is, okay, just pay attention to how you feel, and if it feels uncomfortable, just let everything go. Uh, luckily, that was not the case. I surfaced out uh, with, uh, with the crab again. I put it on the, on the, on the, on the bag. And uh, two, three minutes later, I went back and grabbed the other one. And um, I was, is, is a point I was going to raise. Um, you, you, your life is not worth your gear or even, or a fish or like in that, in that case is, uh, is a crab. But uh, 
you know, we, 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 we all, all in our career of uh, spear fishermen, we will all encounter that moment where, oh, I want to get that fish. So I'm going to, I'm going to wait for that fish to come and, and taking ages to come or like you described the, uh, okay, I was, I was down and uh, just cruising. It was time to come up. I was feeling okay, but it's time to come up and you come back down to have a big fight with two crabs to get them out. A, it's a, it's all the why I was uh, saying having a, that dropping weight. So it could be something a bit similar than that. You just unhook it from your belt and uh, you mark the place and then you can come back on it. Um, there's a, there's a few things we can wait. You know, the crabs, they're not going to swim away. Uh, the, the lobsters not going to swim away. Even may probably, uh, even the fish, if it's still in a, a run, especially in the UK, then they, not very often swimming away from you. Um, if you st they stay quiet, just mark nicely your, your ground. You can come back up and then come back down on them. Uh, they probably will still be around. But thanks, thanks for sharing that. Um, I, can, I can even also share one. I was uh, 16 um, and uh, so I was diving, but uh, obviously on my own, so even worse. And I uh, had my uh, line of my um, floats tied up to me. And I go down, go around the rock, and what's happened on the way back? I was halfway on the way back and suddenly been pulled back down. What's happened? The, the line was just hooked underneath the arches. And then I was just like, wow, what's going on? And uh, you know, when you're just relaxing and coming back up and you just look back down, you say, oh, what's, what's, what's happened? What's happened? Well, I just, I release my bait and let the belts go and uh, I pop to the surface. But all that to say the uh, training into all this uh, emergency kind of situation, uh, releasing your belts, bringing your body back to the surface, treating him at the surface is not something you, you're creating. You, you need to practice it a little bit. I, or during my course, I, I do I do them. Um, Adam, one of the guy I did the course two years ago now, uh, couldn't come on the chat today, but uh, I wanted him to just uh, explain to you what we did during the day. But we do a recovery, we do a dropping weight uh, simulation. So you realize also when you learn how to drop your weight and you drop it, you realize how floaty or buoyancy uh, we are with the wetsuit and all easy is to come back to the surface and float then so um so really um that's that's the thing you on top of all the techniques and all of that uh obviously there is some basic okay uh not forget that one or your bodyboard with a nice flag on it uh your knife and um that's that's uh, that's your that's also your safety line um in the uk we don't have the same problem than the med but in the med if you don't have your float you're going to be run over by a boat and is is 99 percent of uh, risk of you being run over by a boat so on top of uh, being uh, like something to rest on it's also as proper safety things in the med in in France, all the coast in France, even in the north and in Brittany and all of that. UK, I would say, is more for uh, being able to mark, to drop your weight, to rest on it if you're a bit tired, and carry stuff. Um, boats, apart from areas, but mostly boats, they don't come close or less. The the those the, the, the areas are so large. Uh, if you encounter boats, it's not just because you're diving near a harbor, basically. So, but otherwise, you probably won't end up um, meeting a boat. So, but uh, yeah, so your float, your knife, uh, that's really the basic stuff. Well, you, you, you brought the biggest points, like the, the knife is super important. The, make sure that the knife is sharp. It's another point. Uh, I've had an issue when I had to drop my gun simply because my knife wasn't sharp and I was like okay I, I'm not gonna take the risk of trying to cut the line 
It was a 800 euro C4 Urukai, which luckily I found a couple of days later in the same spot, which was good. But uh, yeah, it's like it's a two minute procedure could save you a lot of money or it could be more expensive. It could save your life, basically. So pay attention to the knife. So yeah, for the knife, uh, I think one of the best place to have it, uh, despite having wearing it personally on my cuff for a long time, uh, I really like this this one on on the on the forearm. It's just ready to go very quickly. Or um, I like to have it. When I dive, uh, so I was showing that the other day. Uh, so the, it's a weight, uh, it's a weight vest. I'm not always using it as a weight vest. Uh, I'm using it when the water is dirty, which is quite often in the UK. Uh, so my body can see me when I am in the surface. When he's in the boat, doing the safety for me and looking at me. So when I pop in the surface, he, be, he sees this big orange stuff, bright stuff. Yeah. I know some people would say, oh, uh, yeah, but the camouflage and blah, blah, blah. Well, I don't, well, honestly, I don't care about that. Uh, I'm still catching fish. I'm not losing fish. So uh, if I could have a, a pink, a bright pink uh, top wetsuit, I would have it. But uh, I'm using it as a, as a, um, a kind of uh, vest to be seen. And, uh, and the thing is on the front, you can strap your knife. So... It's even, it's even better, I find it even better because you can both use both ends to grab it. I saw some guys uh, putting the knife on their hands. Uh, I'm using it on my belt. I just like to stay minimalistic when it comes down to equipment and I hate seeing stuff on my hands or like, I don't like it, but it's just a per personal preference. As long as the knife is there, as long as it's sharp and you can use it, like it's fine. Yeah, it needs, it needs to be accessible and sharp. <laughs> um, a main safety thing is your training, you know? Like, obviously, your water time is, is key, but the more training you do on land, the more you know where your limits are. You know when it's really getting uncomfortable, you know uh, where that line is. So then when you're actually diving in the water, you take it seriously, but you know that you're backed up with your, um, you know, your training. So you have more confidence, but you, ha you know where that cushion is. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's all the way. Yeah, you know, if I got that and uh, the boatman don't see me, I can take it off and put it on the top of my spear gun, which is going to be a meter on top of the sea on the on the sea water and uh, if i wave it and he don't see it it's probably because he doesn't have his goggles or he's a bit uh, he's a bit blind but otherwise he should be quite close to me <laughs> what yeah, you could do uh, when we have the waves and you need to marker somebody or you need the boatman to see you what i would usually do is i would lay on my back and i would put my fins up and if you connect them, they make like a giant structure which you can easily spot from very, very far away. Yeah. And you can wiggle them. It's funky and it works. Uh, so yeah, so hopefully guys, uh, we tried to cover quite a, so safety is quite a large, uh, a large unit uh, itself, uh, which try to use cover what to do before. So like Corey was saying, there is a training, they get, getting your uh, lifestyle on the right path and is getting also all your gear and taking care of all your gear so you're not gonna have any issue with your gear so sharpening your knife having your wheel uh, nicely done and uh, ready to undo to be undone um, a float in a good condition with a line properly uh, and not all tangled up um, so that's all the stuff to be before and after on the day of your dive, yeah, just go ahead and uh, and be, uh, enjoy your dive. But uh, once again, just uh, don't push your limits if you are on your own. Don't push your limits if your body is not in capacity because your body is maybe weaker than you. So don't don't take any risk because you might put him at risk as well. 
if you're pushing your own limit that so don't take that kind of risk and uh, don't forget to tell somebody who stay on land where you're going when you might get out and uh, and calling when you get out um yeah um i've been i've been checked uh, about three times by the coast guard <clears throat> while out uh, on the body board um they they of well, it was just a routine check it wasn't uh, nobody w had called them but uh, they hear they hear so we we don't want to waste that time because we just didn't call and suddenly the wife the girlfriend or uh, whoever is uh, suddenly being um, worried about our situation no just be sensible send the text send a bit a small messages um having having your phone having uh, yeah we got so many way of communication and uh, oh, i wanted to mention as well having this kind of uh, stuff on you um you know you never know maybe you, you you're gonna you're gonna have trouble or whatever and uh, somebody gonna find you on the on the beach not not being well but you're not able to tell them what's happened who, who you are so you got a dispatch glue on your wetsuit or on your floats or inside your car and uh, and uh, you'll be they will be able to uh, give the alerts and uh, they they know who you are and uh, right it's still it's still on safety but um a little bit more on um you know this setup to your dive and uh the build up to it beforehand is the nutrition and things so obviously I do a lot of training and things for other sports as well. You know, like I drink coffee. I like coffee. I know it raises your heart rate. And I know this, uh, Anvar, I don't know how you feel about this, uh, but I have a coffee in the morning and I, I like having some oats, some porridge oats. Um, that's how I function well. I've heard mixed things on free dive, uh, free dive posts and videos that I've watched. Some people do have coffee, some people don't. But I would like to know what you recommend before your dive, like say the day of your dive, or even your nutrition previous. So that, that was one of the questions we raised into the, into the, the meeting on Monday, but uh, we can come back on it. So we were saying before, before dive, you don't want to have any heavy meals. So I don't know, don't go and have a, a raclette uh, before your dive or eat like a, a half a kilo of garlic or a big lamb roast is too is too rich so you're not going to be able to assimilate and probably is also going to mess up a bit your sleep because you're going to be burping, uh, burping garlic all night so just so that maybe the couple of days before and also don't don't drink alcohol because alcohol is a um, um, increasing your dehydration so so that's that's the, the main thing and in the morning of your dive uh it's really you need to find what's what's worked for you like you say uh we are not in the performance uh we you know we're not trying to break any record we're going to enjoy our day so if coffee is fine for you go for it i don't, I don't have any problem with that because maybe if we were in the in, on the path to break a record uh, because you want to do like I don't know 130 or 50 meters or whatever, or I might might have to advise uh, from nutritionists and more specialized people. But but for us, it's uh, it's what you're comfy with. Okay, if you if you're comfy with your coffee in the morning, your oat porridge, and is and is a it's a good base to start your day with that. And then after you, during the day, you add up some uh, nuts, maybe some bars or like um, the, the gel they, that the triathletes are using. Why not? But you need to find what suits you and what gives you the right uh, amount of energy to go all the way through your day. Uh, Anvar, I think you can add us. I, uh, I have a different approach to nutrition. <laughs> I love to eat a lot of food, usually, like I'm in love with food, and I would say, well, look, it's like any other training or any other sport. You have to have some break before the meal and the exercise. So let's say two, three hours. I would, I think oats is amazing type of breakfast, 
Well, because uh, as long as it's like uh, complex carbs, as long as it's not something like a cornflake uh, or like some cereal, it's usually very good, like bran flakes, oatmeal. Uh, the, the way I think it's, it's easiest to think about it this way. If you don't put petrol in your car, the car is not going to go any, anywhere far. If you put too much, it's going to cause some issues. If the petrol is messed up, it's going to cause some issues. However, if you do everything right, if you dose it, if the meal is okay, if it doesn't cause the reflux, if it's, uh, if it's not something like, I don't know, like Max said, some garlicky, weird, crazy stuff, then I think it's perfectly fine. But yeah. going out there with, on an empty stomach, like it's not something that I would suggest because, okay, you're not going to feel any funny sensations. <laughs> but if it was me, then I would get hungry. Instead of focusing on being relaxed and instead of focusing on the fish, I would start thinking about food, about the burger, about some, I don't know, French fries and like a roast beef. And then all my thoughts are not focused at the sea at all, I'm focusing on something else. And this is my stuff, I think. But yes, and also one more thing. During the dive, we strongly suggest, well, I do. I strongly suggest to have some snacks. I don't know, it could be some dried fruit, it could be some nuts, it could be a chocolate, like it's, it's fine, as long as we're not on some hardcore diet. But the body constantly loses uh, minerals, nutrients, and we have to constantly add up to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, so exactly what's uh, <clears throat> for in uh, an example. Um, for me, I don't like to have a big, uh, big breakfast when I go spearfishing. It's very light. But what I do is uh, I got intake of food during the day, every hour. A small bar. You know, when you jump back on the boat, I, I know for the the, the the people uh, diving from shore is a bit different. Uh, you need probably to have a bigger breakfast because the intake not can't be that regular. Uh, but on the boat, you're jumping in and out of the boat, so you can just up and grab something to eat. So just small quantity. Otherwise, I got a um, stomach reflux. So I, and I, it's not comf comfortable when you're diving. Uh, so, but that's that's a bit of the time we're uh, gonna teach you what's. Uh, you feel like good with and not what suits you uh, people could have allergies uh, people like usually what I hear most is stuff like citrus or citrus stuff like oranges they, they they're more likely to give you a reflux so if you don't mix some crazy foods like I'm fine I, I once we ordered well, I'm not sure if it's the same word in English. It's uh, like a fried meat kebab, Turkish style. We ordered a delivery to the shore. We went with the boat, got the delivery, went in the sea, and midway through the dive, we would eat regular, like, hardcore stuff. Like, it's fine with me. Some people can't do it. Like, I can. I enjoy it. No problem. But it's uh, trial and error. You have to test your body and you have to see, okay, this works with me, this doesn't, this makes me feel dizzy, this doesn't. And like, but it's important to actually maintain nutrition and hydration during yeah. the uh, There is so many, there's a full range of gel and you need yeah. to have a, a proper chat with uh, maybe the pharmacist or a nutritionist because there is gel for uh, short acting and gel for long, long lasting, long, long acting. So you need to find the right one. Because if you use the short acting one, you're gonna spike your insulin, you're gonna spike your, your uh, blood, blood sugar, and half an hour da later, you're down, you can't move because you, there is nothing left. So you need to find the right ones. It's not speaking up yeah. like, uh, oh, maybe this one, oh, maybe, no. It, you need to have a proper attention on which one you're picking up. Max, you remember, I've done a lot of diving on an empty stomach and I found that my breath hold is a lot better. Um, I can hunt better. And so if I'm going for a shorter dive, I like to do it on an empty stomach. You know, if it's quite a relaxed dive. Boat dives are always fuel for. Um, but Max was mentioning, it's kind of like, I don't know if it's, true but it feels like it is you know when you're uh, when you're hungry your hunting instincts are more in tune you uh 
you want to find the food. Uh, I don't know if that's mental or if. Uh, I'm but, not yeah. sure, though. Like, it, we could debate that, but I think there, there, there will not be one solid ground for that. Yeah. In, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, for 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 sure. But um, the, the also the, the problem actually uh, uh, you had also Corey is you were seasick. So having a, a full <laughs> belly and being sick is just like uh, awful. And uh, but it's it's more like a, a people specific. Eh? But for people who are not yeah. sick normally, uh, I, I would say <clears throat> you need to have a, a minimum intake. I'm not saying get your big breakfast with uh, uh, four slices of bacon, three eggs, the... <laughs> uh, I'm getting hungry, go, on. go for it. <laughs> and, and, and all of that, say, <laughs> I know there is some of you doing it because I see some faces now. <laughs> but... <laughs> yeah, find what worked for you, definitely. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, but uh, yeah. Uh, now we won't change the old ones anyway. So, but uh, for the, for new, the new guys, uh, they if you start getting some uh, habits on your food before diving and be during the week before diving, it could be it could help your uh, well your safety for sure. But um, but also how comfy you're gonna be during the the, the dive. Electrolytes. Oh, you, you need electrolytes, yeah. But uh, uh, Lucozade, example, Lucozade is a. <clears throat> I'm not gonna say it, but uh, it's just sugar. It's pure sugar, and you're gonna bring your uh, your uh, gl uh, your bl blood glucose uh, through the roof, and uh, half an hour later, there's nothing nothing left. So I would find more in pharmacy or some like um, a store st uh, like. Um, uh you call that vegan store and stuff like that they might have some electrolytes but not with uh, added sugar or rich rich in sugar uh, really you need to run away from uh, fast sugar oh no no i know i know it's not about the advertising it's just uh, yeah you need a uh, you need in the water is even better to get your electrolytes in for sure <clears throat> oh, what i used I to, why i used I to do as well is uh, you you can you know, like if you if you go for the leucosate or everything like that, instead of drinking this half liter bottle in one go, you just put like two a quarter of it and in some water. So you top up, and through your day you just topping up like that. So you just diluting the amount of sugar instead of being a big rush, sugar rush, and you will uh, you will prevent that by diluting it and having on the long term instead of uh, in one go 40 grams of sugar. If uh, some of you prefer DIY options, you could perfectly well make them at home. Uh, basically, you go to the pharmacy, you get magnesium, zinc, uh, potassium, and a few other things. You can mix it with any fruit juice and it's much better than anything you get in a shop. But again, it's DIY. Okay, guys, thank you very much. Thank you, Anwar. Thank you for the, your inputs. Uh, thank you, Corey, as well. And bye, Dave. <laughs>